Hello and welcome back. In the previous section, you learned how to modify the virtual environment using a lot of different techniques to customize your scenes. In this section, we are going to have a look at how to interact with the objects in a frame and what components you need to use for the most common interactions such as desktop, case-based and controller-based interactions. Ok, let's get started. When it comes to interactivity, a frame relies on events and events listeners, but you cannot expect interactions to work just like in the 2D web. So you cannot add an HTML event attribute such as on mouse over or on click to the entities in your scene and expect them to behave just like the elements of a standard 2D website, where the events are the result of an action within the browser window. For example, when you hover the mouse over a button or click on it. Because as you know by now, a frame is an entity component system framework that uses JavaScript and WebGL, and therefore events are emitted by specific components that describe synthetic events. Ok, now that I've laid out some things to consider, it's time to put this to practice. So, to create a basic interactivity with your scene, especially on devices that do not have a hand controller, you can use either the cursor primitive or the cursor component, which emit synthetic events like click, mouse enter, mouse leave, mouse down, mouse up and fusing. And they have been named similar to the browser's native events to be familiar to newcomers, but again bear in mind that they are synthetic events. I'm starting with the A cursor primitive, which comes with a default shape, appearance and position, and the A-frame cursor is usually placed as a child of the camera. So when I add the A cursor primitive, you can see it popping up and fix it to the center of the screen no matter where we look or move. I'll show you how to modify these property values in a few minutes, when we move on to the cursor component. Because first I'm going to move around in our scene and click on each cube, so you can see in my HTML document how the cursor component listens to what is being pressed in order to provide a click event. So when I hover on the left cube and then click on it, you can see the code being highlighted in brackets. And you can see this happening again when I click on the center cube and finally on the right cube. And note that the A-frame cursor is not a substitute for the standard mouse pointer, but is a component that is capable of providing those synthetic states for interaction that I mentioned before, because it builds on top of another component that is the Raycaster component. I'm going to show you what is happening under the hood, so I comment the cursor primitives code, then I reload the page, and this time I nest the A cursor primitive inside an empty entity. Which I move to a height of 1.6 meters, that is the user height property's default value in the A camera primitive, and uh, finally I attach the Raycaster component to the cursor primitive, so that I can modify the show line property's uh, default value and uh, change it from false to true. And so if I now move slightly to our left, we can look at the cursor from an angle position and see the Raycaster in action. And this is what provides line-based intersections to check whether that line intersects with other entities. That is what happens, for example, if I attach the rotation component to the parent entity and set its value to minus 12, 0 and 0. If you like analogies, here the cursor is the flashlight that can have different shapes and colors, and the raycaster is the light beam. Well, I'm going to comment the code for the visible raycaster example. And I reload the page. 
so we can have a look at the cursor component. Again, I create an A camera primitive, and to fix the cursor to the center of the screen, I place an empty entity inside the camera, and I finally attach the cursor component to it. Now to make our custom cursor visible, I pull it in front of the camera by placing it on the negative z-axis, so position, 0, 0, and minus 1, and then of course we need to modify its shape and appearance with the geometry and the material components. Instead of using the default ring primitive, that I find to be a bit in the way and too much in front of my eyes when using the VR headset, you can use a very small sphere. Therefore I set a radius value of 0.005, so a diameter of 1 cm, and then to customize its appearance you can set either a black or a white color depending on the overall color brightness and lighting conditions in your scene. So in this case I would go for a black color. Then I set the shader property value to flat. And to make the cursor less intrusive while preserving its effectiveness I set the opacity value to 0.5. You can achieve the same result using a circle primitive, of course, but I noticed that the sphere provides a better collision detection. Now bear in mind that this white background color is actually coming from the blank web page, as you learned in lecture 4. Therefore it has nothing to do with the sky color in your scene, and this means that when you enter VR mode the sky will be black until you create an A-sky primitive that comes with a white color by default. Whereas, as a last example, whenever you are using a dark sky color or a dim lighting conditions or a 360 degrees image that makes it difficult for the user to see the cursor on their screen, you can change its color to white. So this is how you can add and customize the A-frame cursor to your scenes, which is the first step you need to take to create event-based interactions, and I'll see you in the next lecture.